Welcome to the third week of the Body Acceptance Book Club. This week we're going to cover chapters five and six, which is speaking love into your body. And then chapter six is the all or something approach to making sustainable habit changes. So again, a quick introduction of myself and Chris, if you are just joining us. Chris is our beautiful yoga instructor. Thank you. (laughs) Hey guys. You're welcome. Um, She is going to this week actually be able to treat us with some talk, some specific talk about yoga. And then I am the author of the body acceptance book. If you haven't joined us via the Facebook group that we created and all the freebies that you get for signing up to this book club, uh, this virtual book club, actually. Um, you can go to thebodyacceptance.com and then there's a little tab that you can click on for the, the virtual book club and then enter your information and you'll get sent an email with all of the instructions and get connected with us if you want to dive deeper into this work with us and with community. Right, so as always, we're going to start and go through chapter five and then we're going to work our way through chapter six. Chapter six is kind of a doozy. It's the yeah, it's longest one. chapter of the book for good reason a lot of what we've talked about so far is really going to be leading you up to this um you know you kind of get all the tools and this is when you really put them into action and start yeah. making those habits that are going to change your life change how you feel and talk to your body yeah it so. ties everything together which is yeah. how i designed the book to be is you know each topic builds off of another which is kind of the way that you do things so <laughs> All right, so making a smooth segue from the last chapter that we covered last week when we talked about commenting on other people's body, which actually I think we've talked about it every week so far. Yeah, it's come up here and there all over the place. It'll probably continue to come in later in this episode, maybe even the next one. Yeah. Um, But yeah, today we're going to shift the attention a little bit. So into thinking about and talking about how you speak to your own body. So not just Mm -hmm. when you pay attention to like other people's bodies and you know, how, what you're saying might impact them, but do you ever think about the way that you speak to your own body and how that might impact the way that you feel and relate to your own body? Oh my gosh. I love that you asked this. And I think you asked it pretty similarly in the book. It's one of the first questions in the chapter. And immediately I was like, oh my gosh, no, we don't. Like, it took me a long time just to learn to listen to the things I was actually saying to myself, let alone rewrite that story. How did you start to listen? Like, honestly, I think the first kind of aha came from a coach like you, someone who was like, hey, the things you say affect the things you believe, affect the things you do. Mm. And it, it got me curious. Even in that moment, I didn't really know the impact it was going to have, but I was like, well, you know, what kind of things do I say to myself? And I think that's where it kind of has to start with just opening yourself up to that curiosity, to being willing to listen. And then I'd be going through my day and I might catch myself and I'd be like, oh, I don't look good in those jeans. And all of a sudden I'd hear it almost like I was hearing myself for the very first time. I'm like, oh, oh, that's what I'm saying. That's not cool. (laughs) We actually, yeah. And we had a moment like this as we were starting this episode and Chris (laughs) got to see it in real time of like me seeing myself in the camera. And I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything out loud or even really to myself. Like it, I don't know how to describe it, but anyway, it was just like dissatisfaction with like, Mm -hmm. oh, like, I don't like what I'm seeing in the camera right now. Um, but the evolution of that is like, I was telling Chris, she's like, do you want to change or do you want to, you know, do something? And I'm like, you know what? No, just like we've talked about throughout these last few weeks, you know, learning to exist with these uncomfortable feelings and to be okay with it. Like I am tired of holding myself back or feeling like I'm not going to be myself on camera. or I'm not even going to show up on camera today because I don't like the way that I look or, you know, changing my outfit like a hundred times. Mm-hmm. And like, I sometimes know like today it's just a mental thing. Like it just sometimes feels like you, you know, when you know, it's never going to be enough, no matter how many times you change. And you're just like, this is me today. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to exist and be me today. And that's okay. And that's a really powerful recognition because that's almost you saying, 
there is nothing wrong with my appearance right now. This is just how I feel. That feeling is valid. It doesn't need to be replaced. It doesn't need to be fixed. This is where I'm at. And then you can move forward from there. Yeah. And I think that's a really great point. One of the things um, I kind of wanted to bring up talking about, you know, how we talk to ourselves is that first thought, that initial reaction, when you look in that camera and maybe feel dissatisfied, whatever that feeling is, Mm -hmm. we're not really responsible for that, right? A lot of times it is that gut reaction. It's not a choice we're making. It just kind of comes up. So not to be hard on ourselves for that, because that doesn't matter so much as what we choose to do with it. Mm. You know, you choosing to be like, I'm going to show up anyway. I've got people (laughs) waiting on me. Like I've got this. That's incredibly powerful. Yeah. I think that's a great lesson. That's growth. And just remembering that your perception doesn't have to be a reality. Yeah. The way that I'm feeling about how I, you know, what I see in the camera is just my perception. And Chris might perceive me differently. Maybe she looked at me in the camera and was like, hey girl, and looked at herself and was <laughs> like, hey girl. <laughs> and oh my gosh, that's so funny that you mention it. So that's actually a tool that I have used with myself and my clients. Um, and I like to call it the friend filter. All right. So when you catch yourself saying something, thinking something, it doesn't always have to be verbalized. Mm-hmm. But when you catch that thought, you can kind of filter it through, well, what would my best friend say? Or even what would I say if the roles were reversed? So if you're looking at something, you're like, oh, like I look terrible today. Would you ever say that to your best friend? Absolutely. Would she ever say that to you? No. Then why is it okay to say it to yourself? It's not. (laughs) And it's just kind of a nice little reset. You know, we get so used to kind of beating ourselves up and thinking that's normal. Mm -hmm. And something like that can shift us out, put us in somebody else's shoes. Yeah. And you can kind of see it in a new light. See us from a different lens. Mm -hmm. And it is so normalized in our society, though, to like you've seen mean girls where they're like going through the line in the mirror and they're like, oh, it's almost abnormal to like your body. (laughs) You're right. And it's, you know, it's acceptable to sit in your friend's friend groups and be like, I want to change this about myself or this, or I don't like this. And I I definitely think there's a time and space to be able to talk about it. Like I get frustrated when I want to maybe share an experience of how I'm feeling about Mm -hmm. myself, if it's like a negative thought and, you know, maybe I'm not beating myself up, but I at least want to like vocalize it so I can work through it. But I hate when I'm invalidated when someone's like, well, no, like you're fine. Or, you know, instead of like, man, like I know how that feels to have those days or, you know, I can see. Oh, absolutely. No one ever, you never want to fight your feelings, right? Whether they're good, whether they're bad, they're valid. Yeah. And it's what you do with them. Right. So having that safe space to have that conversation is really powerful. But at the same time, you almost wonder, like you almost need that safe space to be like, nope, I'm fucking awesome today. <laughs> I don't know if you curse on here. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. We curse on this podcast. It's uh-huh. got the little E symbol. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's become so normal to dislike your body that you're almost pushed out. If you're like, nah, it's cool. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I like it. Um, the other thing I think is important to why it's important to talk about mm-hmm. like um, about having a moment to validate your feelings and take and leave space for them is because if you do and when you do go through the process of noticing the way that you speak to yourself, you don't want to beat yourself up for beating yourself up. Yes. Because <laughs> we can go into that spiral too of like, oh, I'm so mean to myself. I'm such an asshole. Right? How then- dare I say that to me? Yeah, exactly. And then you feel even shittier than you did before. Mm-hmm. So I think it's really important to recognize that we're doing this work without judgment as and even, you know, that might take practice oh, to yeah, be able to do it without, to do judgment. without judgment. So recognize that is mm-hmm. almost act like Chris said that you're an outside observer or you're a friend. Like, mm-hmm. what would I say to my friend in this situation? What would I say to somebody that I love? Yeah, because I mean, that's the goal, right? We're here trying to love ourselves. So even if you don't always feel that, if you're still building up to that feeling of love and acceptance for yourself learning to speak it first can really be powerful in shaping those beliefs. Yeah. 
And even then it's still not linear. It's not like I love myself. So I'm just going to be a hundred percent on my side all the time. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> I still catch myself all the time, you know, realizing like, wow, I'm saying things to myself, like Lauren, I thought we quit this behavior. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's how I have to talk to myself too. Is like, you know, we don't do this anymore. Yeah. And set those boundaries with yourself. Okay. So once you start to notice the way that you're speaking to your body, you want to pay attention to like, how do I speak to my body and treat myself when I'm feeling good and when I'm not feeling good? And what's the difference between the two? Oh yeah. Because even when we are feeling good, sometimes we may not even acknowledge that. And I think that's just as important as to express gratitude for like, I'm feeling really good in my skin today. Mm -hmm. Like, wow this doesn't always happen. Oh yeah. I remember that. Like when I really first started lifting weights, um, cause that was a big kind of transformation in my life. But when I had a good workout, I was like, cool, you did what you were supposed to do. And I mm. almost didn't give myself any credit for that. That's what was expected. I did what I was supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Whereas if I felt anything short of that expectation, it was like, Oh, like, how dare you let yourself down? Like you didn't do enough, you know? And as much as we want to lift that one up, we also want to give ourselves credit where credit is due. Yeah. Instead of like, oh, that's just expected. And then Mm -hmm. skimming over it. You want to, like I said, express gratitude and, and realize like, it's not self-indulgent to, um, what, how would you describe that? To like talk up to yourself. (laughs) Yeah. Kind of talk yourself up to your own horn every now and then. Yeah. Um, I think especially as women, we're kind of thought to see that as a bad thing Mm -hmm. um, to, you know, walk in a room and be like, I'm hot shit, Mm -hmm. but sometimes you need to. Yeah, exactly. And if it's coming from a place of like real genuine love and admiration Mm -hmm. for yourself, then there's nothing wrong with that. Where it can be a problem is if you're just um, I don't, I don't know. We know the difference between someone with an inflated ego that's doing it out of insecurity versus when you're doing yeah. it from a real from deep a place, place of love. Of, yeah. Of love. And it's okay. Just like, it's okay for you to indulge in self-care or, mm-hmm. you know, to accept your body, no matter what size it is. Like we're taught that all these things are dangerous because then it means that we won't hold ourselves accountable, but I argue, I would argue that it's the opposite. Like, oh, yeah. Well, and I think you'll show up more for the people that you love. And you can kind of look around at the people in your life for examples of that. Um, I'll often go out of my way to make sure my husband has a good day in ways that I wouldn't for myself. So when we do come into that place of self love, we can take care of ourselves in that way. And then all it does is expand love outwards. Exactly. Yeah. So if you feel that you're stuck in a place right now where uh, you do, you are having a lot of negative self-talk or body talk, again, first thing you want to do is just recognize that most of us or a lot of us experience that from time to time, some more than others. And, you know, it takes practice to get out of that thinking. And so for you to start to be able to change the narrative, there's a two-step process that you can implement. And step one is to notice, just notice what the thoughts are. Imagine yourself as like an outside observer. You're on the outside looking in. So you don't have to make these thoughts or words mean anything. Mm -hmm. They're just there. They're just part of what your mind decides to say. Mm -hmm. And then from there, step two is to start to get curious and to question those thoughts and think like, is this really true? Can I prove that this is actually true? Or is it just something I've believed for a long time? And I've decided is true. Mm -hmm. Like, do I have proof of this? And then if I do, like, if you find out it is true, what does that mean? You can walk yourself through your worst case scenario of what it might mean. Because it's oftentimes not as scary as we think it is. Mm -hmm. Another thing that might happen, um, and I know it did for me when I really started to kind of notice and get curious, is you'll find patterns And that can really help you dig back to where these negative feelings or thoughts coming from. Be like, oh, they pop up every time I'm, you know, maybe in the gym or every time I'm interacting with this particular person. The more kind of knowledge you gather around these, the more patterns you identify, the more thoughts you kind of uncover, like a little curiosity detective, the more powerful you're going to be in changing that narrative. 
So don't be afraid. Dive in. That's a good point too. It's like recognizing where your triggers are is yeah. really essentially, you know, what you were saying is like, uh, if for a lot of people, you know, the gym is a place where mm-hmm. social media and, yes. and mm-hmm. then you can be on higher alert when you're in those situations mm-hmm. And you don't have to feel like, oh, I should avoid it because, you know, it triggers me. It's more so this is information. Absolutely. Just when you go into those situations, put your little detective cap on and be like, all right, I'm here. I'm going to listen. I'm going to learn. Yeah. Perfect. So if you want to take that a step further, you can also journal it out. I find that to be really helpful, especially in the beginning, you know, some of the practices and exercises that we share seem really tedious, Mm -hmm. which they can be at first, but then once you get it down, it becomes second nature. So sometimes it's not enough to just kind of work through our thoughts. We need to write them down or talk them through with somebody. So a journaling method that I really like to use is pretty much just having a conversation with your quote unquote higher self Mm -hmm. and imagining that like one voice or one one part of the conversation is you, the other part's your higher self. And Chris actually brought up using different colors for each voice, <laughs> which I really like. Yeah. So I love journaling. I'm very visual, very tactile. Like I need to write things down and it helps me slow down my thoughts enough to process them. So when Lauren was kind of describing almost this method of like self-coaching where she'll write down her thought, then ask herself a question, almost like she's kind of been asking you right now. Um, in my brain, I automatically saw, oh, one voice is one color, the other voice is another color. And it's just little things like that, that, you know, if that sounds silly to you, obviously don't do it. (laughs) But little things can help you to organize and to move through this process a little bit easier. So you can even get curious about that. What works for you? (laughs) Yeah, experiment, experiment, experiment. And Mm -hmm. then Again, it takes time, but once you find out what works for you, keep doing it until maybe it doesn't work anymore. And then that's why we have all these beautiful tools available to us. Along with that method of talking to your higher self and like Mm -hmm. questioning things of like, I'm feeling this way today. Why do I think I'm feeling this way? Well, so-and-so said this. Well, what about what they said makes me feel this way? Like again, self-coaching, but Um, The book called Loving What Is by Byron Katie is a really helpful resource and she teaches you, I think it's like a four-step question process. I think so. And it's essentially, yeah, just saying like, is this true? Can I prove this is true? Like, am I 100% certain? And that sounds really simple and really silly, (laughs) but it's actually really powerful when you think about it, because how often are you held back by the stories that you're telling yourself? Oh yeah. Without having any evidence or support that they're true, Mm -hmm. but you just believe it because you assume like your mind, why would my mind lie to me? Yeah. (laughs) Well, even kind of to piggyback on that, um, just a great book, great recommendation, but even a simplified version is write down what you feel, ask yourself why. Um, And there's an exercise, the five whys, where people do this with goal setting to kind of get to the root of their goal. But honestly, you can do it with anything. Oh, I don't feel good today. Why? Well, maybe my pants were a little tight. Why? And just kind of dig into that a little bit deeper, layer by layer. You can lie your way down, so to speak. I'm trying to think. My pants are a little tight today. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I ate a lot of... Why does that upset you? Mm, okay I was why is that a problem you know? I was like that could send you down a whole different <laughs> rabbit hole I ate a lot of dessert last night why because I wanted it why oh actually that well and that could even get because I was feeling there. emotional why because my boyfriend didn't call me back and I was all alone why <laughs> <laughs> because he doesn't like me <laughs> you know? that's when you have to go into the truth <laughs> <laughs> right but eventually and sometimes it's a curvy road but it'll take you through some unexpected places and just being open, being curious, which we keep saying, keep coming back to. Yeah. Which I, I think it's so helpful to have these tools too. Like it sounds very, it is very therapy based, but Mm -hmm. for me personally, I haven't always been able to afford therapy and I'm realistic in saying that not everyone has access to it. So, you know, even if you are in therapy, you still want to do a compilation of, you know, everything that's available to you. 
Well, these are things that you can even use in addition to therapy. If that's something that you're available to, awesome, like go for it. Yeah. But in those moments when you're trying to get dressed and you're not feeling good about where you are, this can be, you know, five minutes, even 30 seconds of conversation with yourself. Maybe you pull out a post-it note and write some things down, Um, but it's your toolbox, you know, use it how you need it. And these are tools that once you learn them, they're always there with you. Yeah, that was really helpful for me when I used to work in my corporate job too, because I'd be at my desk feeling really uncomfortable. And it's hard when you are feeling so uncomfortable, but you Mm -hmm. still have to function and show up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was a team leader and I had to be there for my team. And so it was really nice to be able to just sit there and journal for like, all it took was five minutes of, okay, I'm feeling uncomfortable in my body. Well, what do I think is going on? Well, this and this and this, and it just helps you release sometimes all we really need is just to release and validate and yeah. then we can move on from there. Can't think of who said it now, but ooh, it might be Trish Blackwell. She's a confidence podcast, mm. but she uses the analogy that feelings are like tunnels, right? The only way to get out of the tunnel is to go through the tunnel. And I think that's what the journaling kind of allows you to do is just take a moment, feel those feelings, move through them. Because otherwise, if you stop, if you get scared of the feeling and stay where you are, you're still in the tunnel. Yeah. And then it gets stuck in your body and then mm-hmm. stagnant. And that's where we build up because a lot like, you know, our, our emotions are energy and, you know, I want to segue actually because of that into talking about yoga yeah, and how you can use yoga to release energy, to get in tune with yourself, to you know, begin, people always ask me like, well, how Mm -hmm. do I really know what I'm feeling? Or (laughs) even if you're on a journey of learning how to eat intuitively for the first time, and you're wondering, like, I don't even understand my body. So I'm going to allow Chris to kind of have a little monologue (laughs) for as long as she needs about yoga and her feelings about that and using it to get in tune with yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So Obviously, I'm a little biased. I like yoga. I think it's a powerful tool for a lot of things. But one of those things that seems especially relevant in this conversation is that it can be a tool to kind of reconnect the mind and the body. So especially when we're talking about how you speak about your body, if you notice that a lot of that speech, a lot of that thought is coming from a more negative place, you're probably in a place where your mind and your body are feeling pretty disconnected. It's almost that same effect that we get with internet trolls, right? Mm -hmm. Where people will say these mean things online because they're disconnected from the person they're talking to. And even when we're looking in a mirror, looking at pictures of ourselves, there's this awareness of I am here physically. I'm looking at this other thing in front of me, this other body, and I'm judging it, Mm -hmm. right? So when we get into movement, get into things like yoga, where the mind and the body literally have to work together. Yeah. So when we move into movement, any kind, whether it's yoga or even something a little less organized, like walking, just putting one foot in front of the other, we quite literally have to bring those two back together. We have to reconnect the mind and the body because that's how movement happens. We send signals from the mind to the body to start moving things. Um, And with yoga, especially, we have this added element of the breath. So every good yoga class is going to include some instruction on how to breathe. And if you haven't done a yoga class, that might sound ridiculous. You breathe every day, otherwise you wouldn't be here listening. But breathing with awareness, right? Bring fresh air in, releasing the stale air out really starts to create an anchor, right? It pulls us into not only the present moment, but into our present body. You've probably even heard me at the beginning of some of classes. We'll take a moment, a lot of times just to arrive here in this moment, in this body, be where you are. So it creates that fabulous connection. So we have the opportunity to hear what our body is saying, whether it's about where our arm is in space as we move through different poses, but we can take that awareness with us off the map too. And that's where you might start to notice things like, well, am I really hungry right now? Or um, what does sound good when you're trying to move toward intuitive eating? So that connection can really move off the mat. But that's one of the reasons I love it so much is it just creates that anchor, that connection that opens up the conversation. Um, And I will go ahead and say this. This is something I tell most of my yoga students. But 
you'll get so much more out of your yoga practice when you stop worrying about what it looks like and start worrying about what it feels like. And that's a big shift. It can take some time to really kind of lean into that. But as you're moving through poses, it's less about, you know, looking like the instructor looks and more about like, okay, I need to kick back through my left heel. I need to lift up through my torso and understanding what that feels like is just going to deepen that connection, that conversation with your body. Yeah, wonderfully said. I love yoga. And I was telling Chris that I've been doing it since, you know, I was like in middle school or something. <laughs> and I found this like yoga Pilates video and it just connected me to my breath, which I'm grateful for at like such a young age that I've been able to use it in all, you know, different types and areas in my life. And I think that's what's helped me understand immediately when people say like intuitive eating mm -hmm. and uh, getting in tune with yourself. I think that's part of what helped oh, yeah. me. And I think that's a really good way to transition into it is literally just through breathing because almost like talking to ourselves or, you know, talking about our bodies, it's things that we do all the time without really thinking about it, maybe without noticing. Mm -hmm. So if you're having trouble noticing what you're saying about yourself, maybe start by noticing your breath. Take a moment. Am I breathing fast? Am I breathing mm -hmm. deep? try to describe it rather than control it at first. Just notice it, sit with it and open up that connection. And just notice. Yeah. Um, and also I love what you said about how it helps you like movement, not just yoga, but movement in general mm -hmm. helps you connect to your body and, you know, um, use it as like a way to, notice how you're feeling, like pay more attention to how you're feeling because some of my best advice, not my best advice, but the best <laughs> advice that I've heard about, like, if you're having a bad body image day, one of the first things that you want to do is movement because yeah. it gets and you, you talk about this in the book quite well too. <laughs> oh, do I? <laughs> you do. Um, I can't remember the exact quote, but yeah, you're talking about when you're having those bad days um, and you kind of start to spiral in your mind getting out of the mind into the body. Yeah. So Chris has a little gift for you. <laughs> yeah. So if this conversation is piquing your interest, if you like yoga, you want to deepen your practice, or you're like, I have no idea what she's talking about, but you're willing to give it a try. I'm actually going to be doing a free self-love yoga class, focusing on opening that connection, listening to the body. We're going to do it virtual, just like our book club. So wherever you are in the world, you're welcome to join us. Um, just check out the Facebook page for more details on how to get signed up for that free class. There's going to also be details in the description box down below too, if you're not part of the Facebook group or if you don't have Facebook, that True. way you can easily find it and sign yeah. up and learn how great of a yoga instructor Chris <laughs> is because I'm not even exaggerating. I've taken a lot of yoga classes and she is by far my favorite instructor. Oh, well, thank you. You're welcome. You're always a joy to have in class. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So that's the conclusion of chapter five, which is really a, about changing the conversation with your body yeah. and noticing then how that changes, how you show up in the world, how you approach your goals, um, how you treat your body, how you practice self-care, all of that. Absolutely. I think it all starts with your words. That's the foundation for everything else. Yeah. Your, your words, your actions. Thoughts. Yeah, they all come from there. Yes. Now into chapter six, where we're going to talk about all or something versus all or nothing, which in my opinion is a game changing um, mindset shift to make. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's one of those that's so beautifully simple, but that doesn't always mean it's easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so hear her out give it a try, give yourself some grace. <laughs> exactly. And so much. So, I mean, I believe in this statement so much that my brand actually used to be called all or something living because I need this daily reminder as a recovering perfectionist, mm -hmm. you know, I have to remind myself that it doesn't have to be a hundred percent. It doesn't have to be perfect. I can take elements and do my best. Like I can show up to the gym one or two days a week. And like, if I miss Monday and Tuesday at the gym, like I did this week, actually, <laughs> you know, after we just went to Tokyo for Thanksgiving and 
um, I came back and I needed to rest on Monday. And then, yeah, I don't think I went to the gym on Tuesday either, but then I just dove back into it starting yesterday and today, because I remembered that I don't have to make it every single day of the week. If I'm just showing up, that's good enough. Yeah. And I think that's the perfect example because that's really what's at the heart of this whole strategy. So often we feel that we have to do it all, that we're either going to be good or bad, right? Mm -hmm. That it's done or it's not done. Black or white. Exactly. And we've talked about this a little bit in other episodes, but just recognizing that life isn't black and white. It's this whole big gradient of gray. Spectrum. Yeah. I like the word spectrum. (laughs) But it is. And so some days you're like, you can show up with everything you have, but everything you have is going to look so different day to day and giving yourself that grace to do what you can when you can and know that it doesn't have to be all or nothing. That it can just be something. Have you ever read the book, The Four Agreements? Yes. This just made me think of it. One of the agreements Uh is to do your best. But the author even mentions that your best is going to be different every day. And Mm -hmm. only you know what your best is. And some days, again, you'll fall short of even what you know to be best. But then that's where that self-compassion comes in of, okay, like, what can I implement next time? And yeah, and just recognizing some of those other things that are at play, you know, maybe I don't feel 100% today. I can still do something. And that something is going to be a huge win, just as big as if I had done twice that on a good day, you yeah. know? So. Exactly. And that's really helpful too. If you want to say, make movement, I love using movement or exercise as an example, but you want to make it a habit, but you know, you expect yourself to go hard every single day. That's not realistic, especially for us as, you know, women, if you do have a period or you notice cycle changes and you're not going to have the energy to go out hundred percent. But if you're thinking I'm not going to work out if I can't do it this specific way, and then you just don't show up, then you're not going to be consistent and you're not going to show up for yourself. But if you think like, what am I feeling? Maybe I could do something a little more gentle like yoga today. Yeah. And I think one thing that a lot of people, myself included, are kind of scared of when we first kind of encounter this approach is that, well, if I you know, let myself off easy. I'm not going to get enough done. But when you give yourself this space to notice where you are and to respond accordingly, you, you will have some days where you don't get quite as much done. You also kind of have other days where maybe you have more energy because you rested, you know, because mm-hmm. you've been responding to your body and your energy levels as they come and go. So it actually ends up evening out quite nicely and I mean ultimately you get more with this approach I feel like than pushing 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 because that'll ultimately lead to burnout (laughs) for a long period of time for some yeah so you know it does kind of wiggle and wave but overall you maintain your course very well when you work with your body yeah versus the ups and downs of trying to push through fighting trying to show up trying to shoot for perfect yeah and you know what sometimes just like anything when we're implementing something new or learning to practice something that's unique or you know Mm -hmm. something that we've never done before you might go to an extreme especially if you are used to practicing extremes so I know that at first when I was you know thinking in terms of all or something and giving myself Mm -hmm. a lot of grace I did get really lenient on myself to the point where I was not showing up more often than I was Mm -hmm. showing up. And that's when self-compassion and awareness and intention come to play because I, I knew I was like, okay, it would be, I would wake up. And if I would feel slightly tired, it was like, you know, I'm not going to do this. Like, I'm, I'm just not going to go to the gym this morning. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to experiment with that and notice that like, okay, I'm taking the easy way out now because Mm -hmm. it is realistic to think that like, oh, if I give myself too much leniency, then I'll just fall off. You might, but then you'll have the awareness to get yourself back and to realize that there is a balance between accountability and self-compassion. Oh yeah. What do you think about them? 
it can be hard to find that line for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's definitely one that like, I still bounce back and forth in my head. Sometimes, you know, you have to have that conversation. It's like, am I tired today or am I lazy today? And if I am lazy, is that okay? Um, and a lot of times I'll just try to kind of reason my way through it. Um, I like to think of it almost as like a reality filter. So, you know, if I am feeling tired, like what's going on in my life that might be making me a little bit more tired right now? Is it something like, oh, I am on my period right now that can affect my energy levels. Um, what has my activity been like the last couple of days, you know, physically or mentally, have I had a lot going on and kind of use those to gauge where I'm at because sometimes the initial feeling isn't always that reliable, you know, um, and it's not a perfect system, but it does help just to add a little bit more information to the equation. And again, I always think about putting on that detective hat and trying to kind of why my way through it, you know, why do I feel like this? Okay. Does that make sense? How will I feel if I don't do this workout? How will I feel if I do do this workout? I'm trying to kind of put myself in those shoes as well has been helpful for me. Yeah. And adding to that too, a helpful scale is like, paying attention to what am I doing most of the time? Because if you do start to notice the pattern shifting the other way in a direction where you don't want to be going, where you realize like movement is really important to me, but I notice that I'm skipping my workout like four out of the seven days of the mm -hmm. week or whatever, you know, whatever your goal is, then it's time to start to do what Chris said too. Like along with that is like question you know, why am I like, what's going on? Am I expecting too much out of myself? Am I, do I need to scale back on something? Do I need to reprioritize something? Yeah. And, and that's a great point. Like whatever goals you set for whatever reasons, they're not set in stone. It's not a failure to rewrite your goal. Um, sometimes you need to, sometimes you didn't know what you were in for. Sometimes life changes around you and there are new circumstances to consider. Yeah. And you can adjust and that's mm -hmm. what's beautiful about life is yeah. you can, you know, go with the flow and, and what you desire or what you need can change all the time. And that's why we like to stay in tune with ourselves constantly so that we can recognize and make those yeah. adjustments. And sometimes it might take a little bit to realize it and that's okay. Mm -hmm. So speaking of when it comes to the process of transformation, we want to set realistic expectations mm -hmm. for what transformation looks like. And what oh, this is just a great topic. And it's, you know, having come from the environment of being a personal trainer, being a group fitness instructor, um, I had a lot of people who came there for transformation. I think people came exclusively to my gym for transformation, whether it was physical or emotional, but um, we worked with a lot of beginners, right? And nine times out of 10, maybe 10 times out of 10, the expectation for how quickly that transformation was going to happen was not even anywhere close right? to the reality. Yeah. But what would happen, um, and this is ideally what you want is they would fall in love with the process and almost lose sight of the goal a little bit. Mm. Um, so for example, we got a lot of people that would come with weight loss in mind, right? But then they find a community here. They find that they enjoy moving their bodies. They find that they have more energy when they move their body and they keep showing up for those things and they stay with the habit for those things. And weight loss may or may not happen, but you almost forget the goal. And I think that's the best transformations when you're almost not working for one, when you're choosing your habits, whether or not, not where they're going to get you. I love that. And then all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're like, oh my gosh, like, mm -hmm. because it's just been so fun and so enjoyable and what a opportunity and you know, what a, what an experience to offer your clients, because not everyone does that. You know, a lot of people are just so focused on the end goal mm -hmm. and weight loss and is my body changing and I'm not seeing results fast enough. So I might as well quit. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea of falling in love with the process, which I think is what makes it so important for you to realize what feels good for you. Mm -hmm. What doesn't feel good? What can you keep up long-term? Oh yeah. Where can you, what can you do um, that's going to be sustainable for again, how, 
adjusting your expectations, knowing that it's not going to be perfect a hundred percent of the time. That's where you tie into the all or something approach Mm -hmm. into the process of transformation. Absolutely. And I think a lot of times when we're talking about transformation, um, especially again, coming from that fitness perspective and weight loss being a hot topic in that industry, a lot of people think of transformation as, oh, I'm going to suffer through this for 30 days, whatever Mm -hmm. promise is out there at the time. They're like, I'm going to suffer through this so I can live over here in transformation. But the problem is you don't live in the transformation ever. You live the process. The process. And then once, if you're, and that might change your reality, it might transform it over time, but you're still living in that process because once you stop living in that process, your reality is going to change back. Right. Exactly. And that's where we get it wrong so often is in thinking, yeah, I just have to push really hard. And then it's back to wherever you go, there you are. You're still Mm -hmm yourself maybe you've learned a few things along the way yeah, hopefully you you've some got something out of it. resilience um but ultimately whatever you do good bad or otherwise if you do it and then stop it completely go back to what you're used to your life will go back to what it was back before to square one yeah so what about taking smaller steps then and allowing them to integrate yeah and giving yourself time and space and knowing that this is Uh, as cliche as it sounds this is a marathon it's not a sprint Mm -hmm. no it's true and I think you know not that transformation is a bad thing or that you shouldn't ever want to transform your life your body whatever it may be but do it in a way that you're willing to keep doing it right so if you're like I want to lose weight well are you willing to never eat pizza again if that sounds like a terrible idea don't try to lose weight that way (laughs) it's just a (laughs) terrible idea Okay, Orca's putting her little paws <laughs> under the door. I don't know if you could hear her jingling all around this. I lot, thought I so. saw something. <laughs> yeah, she's like full on just sticking her paws mm-hmm. under the door. But yeah, sorry. But yeah, you know, if that's what you think you need to do, try to scale that back to a level that you're okay with being forever. You know, maybe maybe I don't eat pizza every day. Is that something you can do forever? Or maybe when I have pizza, mm-hmm. I incorporate it with like a vegetable or something yeah, else or like instead of having three slices I'm gonna have one slice you know <laughs> I'm all about adding versus taking uh-huh. away though because if I told myself I can't have I'm like I'm only gonna have one slice oh girl I'm gonna have five slices <laughs> like I that's have fair. to that's why I think for me it helps to be like I'm gonna add yeah. I'm gonna eat my pizza that's true. as a side like if your go-to is always pizza for dinner maybe say I'm gonna cook my own meals three nights yeah. a week and shift it out make that way homemade pizza or you know mm-hmm. something like that that way Absolutely. you feel like you're like you know adding abundance versus because we always want what we can't have mm-hmm. but I love what you're saying too because I still that comes up for me all the time mm-hmm. still is like I want to lose weight well then it's like okay well what are you willing to do long term yes. because I already know the trap of restricting something Mm -hmm. or cutting calories or like I was just saying taking away this is why I love to focus on adding in because when it is taking away like how long is that going to last can I do this for life well what I realistically can do for life is add in movement that I think is really fun and enjoyable Um, I can round my meals out with a combination of Mm -hmm. proteins fats and carbs and vegetables and fruits and experiment with all of the things that actually really do enjoy. And then maybe naturally it's going to crowd out foods that I want to eat less of, um, or working on my relationship with food in the grand scheme of thing that things, I know that that can sound intimidating and like a waste of time because then you have to spend time, which for me was like a few years, Mm -hmm. really spending time being comfortable with, if I want pizza every night, I'm going to have pizza every night. Yeah. And realizing that the reality is there's a thing called habituation Mm -hmm. where, which I've talked about on here too, where something, if you have it over and over again, it gets less appealing every time. And that's why, even if you did, like you would get sick of pizza the same way that you get sick of eating an apple every day. Oh yeah. Or doing anything else about that. Like I, there's a ramen place by my house, Kaijiro. I love it. But if I have it more than twice a week, I'm like, I don't want to look at another noodle. (laughs) 
I, yeah, I did that with pho in Vegas yeah. too. And yeah. it's just as humans, we crave variety and embracing that variety is fantastic. Yeah. You know, in your movement, in your food, in your wardrobe, like experiment, be you. <laughs> and trust that it will all even out. It sometimes feels like you're going too hard in say the rest. And then you realize like you're resting. I guess I should have clarified that <laughs> you're, you're relaxing a lot. And Chris mentioned earlier that like, sometimes you need that break and you'll come out of it more creative than you started and just trusting that like oh my gosh I've been really lazy for five days that's part of the process sometimes oh yeah and I think sometimes we're scared and it's partly because we think the transformation is going to happen faster than it really is but we also think oh my gosh I had like I had way too much ice cream last night or like oh I skipped the last three days of my workout that's not going to make a crazy difference in the long term of your body right away like you don't have to jump in and correct that all of a sudden, just jump back on track and your body, it wants to stay at homeostasis. Like yes. it is not trying to swing with you every day. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Actually. Oh, yeah. I, 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 all, I used to say that all the time. Your body wants to maintain, like our bodies are designed to maintain mm -hmm. homeostasis. Yeah. It so wants just, to be as efficient and stay as steady as it possibly can. Yeah. Which is just like, it's built like a, um, I always forget the thermostat in a house, like mm -hmm. it's going to, you know, if the temperature changes, then it's going to kick on and it's going to say, we need to raise the temperature or we need to lower the temperature. But so often we feel that we have to intervene and we have to control mm -hmm. instead of allowing our bodies and our intuitions to guide the way for us. We feel like it's so scary to release control. And I can understand why that would be. Yeah. But if you just give yourself some leeway and practice releasing control and seeing what that does for you, maybe that's where the transformation is. Yeah. Maybe it's more mental. Maybe it's releasing all those limiting beliefs or things that have been holding you back. Yeah. All right. Well, now that we've talked about the process of transformation and having realistic expectations, I guess the last thing we can say about that is that transformation is not linear either. Oh gosh, not even a little bit. <laughs> no. And, and that can be really hard and frustrating too, because you think that like, I thought I've done this work before, or mm -hmm. I thought I was over this. And I, th I think that we forget to give ourselves credit for how far that we mm -hmm. have come. And like, you know, we think we're back to where we started. Did yeah. I mean, you'll definitely come around and you might recognize the patterns, but you also have to recognize how, like, your growth. And sometimes that's just in, oh, I recognize that behavior. Even if it's like popping up and you're like, oh, I don't do that anymore. Like that was growth. Your response to it. Yeah, that's true. Because before maybe it was an unconscious behavior, mm -hmm. but even the fact that like you're catching it. Yeah. That's a big one too, because um, just being able to catch on to self-sabotaging behaviors mm -hmm. or thoughts early on that way they don't just bury you like maybe they used to. Yeah. That's growth. Even just that awareness, which can almost feel worse at first because now you're catching all the bad things that yeah. are happening or the mean things you might be thinking or saying. Um, but just again, knowing that that's part of the process, it's not a linear process, but trusting that you're on that path. Yeah. And celebrating the small wins along the way mm -hmm. and recognizing that like, you know, even if I have dipped down a little bit, now I have the tools to bring myself mm -hmm. back up. I'm not the same person oh, yeah. I was. And I think that's kind of a really cool way to see that growth too, is even if you feel like you've dipped down, maybe even back to where you started or further than where you started, how quickly you come back from that is going to be like a huge measure of your growth. Now you've had that experience. You've had those tools to pull you back in so much quicker. That's kind of like what we were talking about before this episode, when mm -hmm. I was telling you about like how my hormones are like kind of making me a shit show. <laughs> and you said my shit show is, what did you say? Oh, I told her that um, your shit show is still some people's idea of like a good day. Yeah. And that is from me intentionally mm -hmm. working on that and knowing you know, how to bounce back quicker than maybe I used to, where I would get buried in my emotions and the things, yeah. and then tell a story to myself. And the next thing I know I'm out for a month and now it's like, it's a, maybe a few days. And then even then I've learned how to function through it. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, that came from me getting really honest with myself and, and tying everything in that we've been saying of like, okay, what level of accountability do I want to take here? Mm -hmm. And then what level of rest do I need and self-compassion and self-care um, and then all or something mindset, bringing yeah. that in, which I think I want to quickly go over the ways that you can apply the all or something mindset into different areas of your life. Um, so I'm going to ask you, Chris, okay. when it comes to your eating habits, <laughs> how can you apply all or something? Oh, so one of my favorites, um, this is something that we did in Persistent Nutrition, which is um, a nutrition coaching organization. Um, but we had this exercise with foods where we would take all the foods that we typically label as good and bad, right? And we strip those labels off because those labels aren't helping us. That's the black and white, the good or bad, all or nothing thinking that we wanna get away from. And rather than use those labels, we would relabel each food. So something that was previously a bad food for me might be ice cream. Truth is I love ice cream, it's not a bad food. It's a wonderful food. Mm-hmm. But it's something that if it's in my house, I will eat it almost every night. So I relabeled it just like that. This is a food that I tend to overeat if I buy a lot of. So now I buy ice cream in really tiny containers and I don't overeat all the ice cream, right? Mm -hmm. But relabeling even your good foods, something like kale, rather than just say, this is a good food, maybe say, this is a nutrient dense food. Mm -hmm. It just, the more knowledge gives you more power it empowers you to make those decisions that are going to support you to choose that all or something. Yeah. So that's one of my favorite examples for food specifically. I love that, especially the ice cream example, because that's something I've learned about myself as well Mm -hmm. is there are certain foods that used to be, you know, you might think I tend to eat overeat ice cream, Mm -hmm. therefore it's not allowed in my house or I'm not allowed to have it, or I need to cut it out completely. When really sometimes what you need to do is just tweak it a little bit. So for me with ice cream, I recognize if I sit down on the couch in front of the TV mm-hmm. with a whole pint of ice cream in my lap, I'm going to eat all of that in one mm-hmm. sitting, no matter how healthy my relationship with food is or whatever my intention is. It's just, yeah. I'm doing it unconsciously. I'm not paying attention. And so because I realized that ice cream is a really decadent food for me that I really love and could probably eat like five pints in one sitting, I know that what serves me is to savor it and to sit down and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So I will instead put a bowl of ice cream, maybe Mm -hmm. even add like a brownie or a cookie. Like I want to make it really exciting and Mm -hmm. upgraded. And then I'll sit down maybe with some music in the background to where I can really pay attention to that experience. Mm -hmm. And I notice then that like, oh, I'm satisfied from eating this. And it's a perfect example. You're making an informed decision that isn't all or nothing. You can still have some in a way that serves you. I think that's my favorite part. (laughs) In a way that serves you. It is so empowering when you're like, I don't have to cut out all these things that I Mm -hmm. love. I can figure out how I can incorporate it and enjoy it. And I just love the example of upgrading, having like the high high quality version of the things Mm -hmm. that you love. If you have access think it's also realistic to, you know, notice and acknowledge that not everyone has access to the higher quality version of things. That's fair. And that's part of figuring out, okay, well, this is fine. Like, like frozen vegetables and fruits. Maybe Mm -hmm. that's all I have access to in my area. That's perfectly fine for you. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that can be where it's really helpful as far as stripping away the good labels too, Mm -hmm. right? If you see something like organic kale, is a good food, you might feel bad that you don't have access to it or that you maybe just don't like the flavor, right? Like I don't like tomatoes. (laughs) Those are something that should be good for me, but it's a food that I don't enjoy the taste. So it's okay. Yeah. And you can kind of empower yourself to even feel better about the good foods you do eat, right? Yeah. So, yeah, there are so many foods in the world and so many options, nutrition, like you know, despite what you might hear from the dieting industry, or even sometimes or often actually the wellness industry Mm -hmm. of, you know, that the good, what quote unquote was good for you Mm -hmm. um, is a very limited thing. And it changes all the time what it might be. But when it, 
you know, there's just such a variety available to us and it's going to look different for all of us. Well, actually Okinawa, where we are now is a great example. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you've looked into this at all, but Okinawa has, um, there's a village up north with the highest like population density of super centarians. Mm -hmm. So these people that are living past 110. So obviously pretty healthy people. Their diet is so much different than other, what we would consider very healthy diets in other places of the world, like the Mediterranean diet. They're eating completely different things, both getting fabulous benefits from them. Like there's no one size fits all with healthy. Yeah, exactly. And you're, I guess if, if it's important to you, your goal is to aim for what is right for you. Yeah. And knowing that it's not going to look perfect for anybody and anyone that <laughs> claims that their journey is perfect and that <laughs> they're they do everything something. perfect. Yeah. They're not being honest about it, whether that's being honest to themselves or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. for whatever reason we want to appear perfect to other people, but you're never just going to be on one end of the spectrum. Yeah. You're going to float all along the spectrum mm-hmm. and that's okay. Okay. So we've already talked a lot about all or something when it comes to exercise so what do you think when it comes to self-care, how can you apply that mindset to self-care? Mm, self-care is hard. I threw her doozy. <laughs> I feel like most people don't really know what they mean by self-care. Um, mm-hmm. We tend to think of it like it's bubble baths and manicures and almost kind of the luxury items, mm-hmm. whereas self-care some days for me is just taking five minutes away from my computer. Right, five minutes to breathe, to clear my mind, to go get a glass of water because I've been working for an hour. Um, and I think that's a big part of it, you know, recognizing that both of those can be <laughs> <laughs> work on your <laughs> Um, But I think that's a big part of it, recognizing that both of those sides of the spectrum can be self care, but that it is that spectrum. And I don't have time for a bubble bath every day, I don't have time for a bubble bath most days but I can still take care of myself. It doesn't mean I have to put me on the back burner. Yeah. Well, even just the sun, that's such a beautiful example of the something is, you know, for you to take five minutes for yourself versus I I think self-care has been so romanticized Mm -hmm. to where people think that it has to be luxurious bubble baths or buying myself a Chanel bag today. But self-care is going to look different for everyone. And it's going to look different depending on how much you have, how much time you have available, how much energy, like what your capacity is for that time. Mm -hmm. But recognizing that self-care is an important part of your overall health and wellness. Yes. That you want some in there and that that some might look different. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Now what about body image? (laughs) so with that for me I think all or something is kind of knowing that I don't have to look or feel amazing all the time to love who I am Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. um like it's kind of like my hair doesn't have to be perfect my outfit doesn't have to be perfect but I can still show up as me um whereas when you're more you know, all or nothing, it might be like, oh, I'm either going to get dolled up like full face, I'm going to look great, or I'm going to hide from the world today. Mm. Um, And, you know, part of it, just being an entrepreneur, being someone who has to show up for other people. Some days I kind of had to push through on days where I wasn't a hundred percent. So it kind of taught me to be comfortable with that. Um, But even kind of like your example, jumping on today, did you feel all but did you feel enough you know yeah I felt something I or or like you said I just you just have to show up for yourself some days and even if you're not feeling it 100 percent and I think it's rare where I have a full day where I'm just (laughs) like oh I feel so good in my body those days are rare and I celebrate them Mm -hmm. but most days it's a mixture of moments where I feel really in tune with my body and then other moments where I'm like who are you and then most moments of the day I'm just neutral because I'm busy living my life yeah which is actually really nice like you don't want to be thinking about your appearance your physical self all of the time that would be 
terribly exhausting. It would because our body is just a vessel that yeah. gets us through life. And I mean, it's more than a vessel, I guess. It's, it's a part of the team. Yeah. But it doesn't yeah. have to be the star player. Yes. It's a part of the team. And it's a very important part. We need our vessel to be functioning mm -hmm. in order for us to do the things that are important to us. But we are so much more than just our bodies. And we have so much more to offer the world. And I love, I want to go back to focusing on how you're feeling mm -hmm. and how you want to feel. Because, you know, so often we're chasing after something like losing a certain amount of weight or get it, gaining muscle or gaining mm -hmm you know, whatever your goal is, yeah. this external, you know, um, thing that mm -hmm. you're after, what's really beneath the surface is a feeling. Yeah. And how can you start to harbor that feeling in your life now using self-talk, using the all or something method, using the habits that you perform on a daily basis? And how can you start to um, build your life around that and, you know, look at what's important to me mm -hmm. and prioritize your life from that place. And you think about what can I release? Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Do you want to say more on that? <laughs> um, actually, I just, I was talking about this earlier today. Um, one of my favorite Zen proverbs that's just been on my mind a lot right now is let go or be dragged. Mm -hmm. And it can sound a little violent at first, but I'm all about the violence. <laughs> yeah. It's just this idea that, you know, whether it's um, a thought that you've been holding on to or habit you've been holding on to at some point, if it's no longer serving you, you can either let it go or you can let it drag you along and kind of give up control of your story. Mm -hmm. um, so just when you I talked about kind of releasing things, it really made me think of that and just letting go of the things that aren't serving you and choosing what you want to move toward, you know, maybe not even choosing hundred percent what you feel in this moment, but what you're moving toward. Yeah. And so often we just give our power away yes. to everything of, well, I have to do this because this is what a good wife does, or I have to do this because, you know, I, um, I don't like my body or, people that look like me don't have this level of confidence. So mm -hmm. I have to lose weight first or else, you know, so-and-so won't let me be who I want to be. I allow this to happen all the time of like how I feel about my body to dictate again, like today was a good day where I chose to show up anyway, but that doesn't happen every single day. But I recognize that it's important to me. So that's something I prioritize mm -hmm. of showing up and just being me and remembering that like the feeling that I'm after is love and connection mm -hmm. with people that I care for. It's joy, it's pleasure. And so my constant thoughts are how can I tap more into that? What are the activities that I can do? And that pulls me into a direction that I want to be in mm -hmm. where I'm just guided and I just move closer and closer to it. And then along the way, release so that the power isn't being fought by something, uh, you know, like yeah, so, something true. else is reaching, like you Holding said, onto. dragging, something's trying to drag me in this direction mm -hmm. while I'm trying to move in this direction. Yeah, it's almost kind of like letting go of your baggage. You don't have to carry around those heavy things you've been telling yourself anymore. Just let them go. Let them go. And I so slow you down. Yeah. And move toward what you want, what are your thoughts and feelings oh on all of that. I just... I love everything that you said. I don't know um, how much I can add to it other than just kind of agree with that sentiment. You know, the best thing you can really do for yourself is be clear on what you want. And you don't always have to, or hardly ever have to know how you're going to get there. Sometimes mm -hmm. being too attached to how you think you'll get there can hold actually, yeah, hold you back. But being clear on those things that you value most, that you want, um, like you said, for you, things like joy, connection, love. And making an effort to move toward those, however big, however small that effort is, and putting some of your trust in the universe that it will get you there. Yes, beautifully, beautifully said, beautiful <laughs> place to wrap up. We encourage you this week to just start thinking about what it is that you want and desire and what the feelings 
that you're, what are the feelings that you're after and how can you start to move toward that? And how can you tweak your beliefs and the way that you speak to yourself to guide you in that? And how can you, when you feel that you get stopped up, how can you think in terms of all or something mm -hmm. on those days where it's hard to release control and you're stuck in that cycle of perfection? Yeah, I love that. All right. Well, do you have anything else left to say before we close <laughs> this one out? I think we covered it quite nicely. Um, just again, remembering to connect with your body. Remember that you're on the same team and you guys are working together. And again, we'll have that yoga class coming up for you guys very soon. So I hope to see you there and we can start that connection and conversation. Yes. Thank you. I hope you have enjoyed this week's episode. Let us know what you thought in the Facebook group, or you can connect with either of us on Instagram. I'm at Lauren M. Kendrick and yoga Chris Okinawa. And we will also leave that in the description <laughs> or the show notes. If you haven't already joined us, it's still, it's not too late. You can still get the freebies for signing up with us, which yeah. is a study guide that you can use um, to go along and help, you know, if you have a group and you want to guide the discussion using that, mm -hmm. then there's also my body acceptance workbook for free, which is actually going to go on sale next month for $17. So you're gonna get it only while you can. yeah <laughs> get it while it's hot yeah um, and it's got some great stuff I got a sneak preview while she was still in production on that one and it's just it's an incredible tool to take you deeper you know we've kind of been talking you through some of these things giving you the suggestions this is basically the workbook you need to dive in um it's beautifully laid out. Highly recommend. <laughs> and guides you step by step because I do realize that sometimes some of what we're talking about may seem abstract yes. and like a lot. And that's fine. You know, you can move through the work at your own pace. And the workbook will help break it down into simpler steps mm -hmm. and tell you exactly what you need to do. So yeah. I hope you'll grab a copy of that. Thank you again for watching. And we will talk to you again next week. Bye, Bye guys. <laughs>